And good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, our Father's Word, Zechariah, remembered of Yah. And you know, our Father does remember us. Our Father knows exactly what's happening in this world. He never forgets. But this remembered of Yah, in a sense, has to do with remembered, and it's time for the cup of wrath. It's time that He returns and to bring again the captivity of his people. As we discovered in chapter 1, that he sent scouts, four horsemen, on uh, scouts to uh, spy out and find out uh, how things were on the earth. And their case was that it was about harvest time. And God shared with us the fact that there were four hidden dynasties that we should be very careful of. That's to say the horns of verse 18, chapter 1. And then he gave us the blessing of four carpenters. That means they can work with any material like blacksmiths. And they're going to corner them in. We have power over our enemies. God always, for every negative there is a positive, and for every positive there is a negative. And our Father gives his children and as much as if, if they should choose right, the ability to overcome any obstacle, even Satan. Don't ever forget it. As I stated, this book of Zechariah is so complete, you could almost teach the entire Bible from it, especially the book of Revelation. Much of what we will cover in this chapter 2 that we're about to begin, uh, I'll make reference to different places in the book of Revelation that um, actually apply. And it is a second witness. Let that second witness be with you and absorb it, enjoy it, um, and our, never forget, our Father is in control. Word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, chapter 2, verse 1, the great book of Zechariah, remembered of Yah, and it reads, I hope you get from this God's purpose, okay? I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. We see this measuring line in the book of Ezekiel concerning the Millennium Temple. We see this measuring line in what? Uh, in the great book of Revelation in a couple of chapters. And um, measuring what? Again, surveying. Looking over, is it time? This particular man will happen to be measuring Jerusalem, and he'll be told here in a moment, you might as well stop. It will do no good because of the overabundance of people that will accept salvation. Verse 2, Then said I, Whither goest thou? What are you doing? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof, uh, how, how, how big we should make it. And you might consider this would be like throwing a family tent. How big should we have so the whole family can fit? Verse 3, And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. So we've got a lot of divine intervention taking place here, meaning whatever message we receive, it's going to be from our Father. Okay, verse 4, And he said unto him, Run and speak to this young man. In other words, don't delay, run. Saying, um, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. Stop measuring is useless, basically is what's implied here. It's useless to measure. There's not going to be any walls. You don't have to measure to build a wall. It's going to be an open town. Do you know why? Because God is going to be our wall. That's, that's stipulated in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. God is our wall. He is our defense. God is whom we draw our strength from, especially when it comes to dealing with the supernatural. He trusts us to give us power over our enemies, including the supernatural, as long as you use it wisely. Verse 5, For I, saith, uh, saith the Lord, and this is the Lord speaking, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. God is always our glory. And again in Ezekiel 38, chapter 11, he declares again 
that he is this wall. This is why that even today, there, there are no longer, as far as God's elect are concerned, any giants in this world. Anytime you think you've run up against an immovable object, forget it. All things, if you're serving God, all things are possible. And you can cut it. You can do it. And uh, you can do the Father's work. He'll furnish the brick. You do the building. And God will always bless you. But he is that outer wall. You don't, you don't need any other protection than that as long as you utilize common sense to take care of yourself. And you have to, when it comes to your spirituality, that is to say, what the truth, which is God's word, you got to take care of yourself. Naturally, we share with each other and everything, but when we come right down to the day, that's to say judgment day, you've got to, you've got to decide for yourself because you will be judged on what self has decided and lived. Not what someone else has, but what you have. So uh, no one understand that wall is there. I, I could quote this wall again. It is, there is a city and it would be considered to be New Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 20. And at the very end when Satan is released a short season, he puts together an army to come against Jerusalem to take it again. He likes that holy place. This is at the end of the millennium, beloved. He comes to take it again, but what happens? There is a wall of fire around the city. The people don't lift a hand. God does him into, puts him into that lake of fire because God is a consuming fire. God takes care of his own as long as you use common sense. Continuing with verse 6. Verse 6 reads, Ho, ho, or really it's up, up. Come forth, you escape out of her, and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, of the heaven, saith the Lord. I've scattered you, but at the same time I've guided you. And God has scattered his people. What, what is this sides of the north thing? Do, do you not remember Isaiah chapter 14 where Satan always uh, wishes the side of the north? Do you know why? Because that's where God's altar is. That's God's favorite place. Is, and, and what he's saying here is Satan, when he comes back, he's going to try to, uh, to reclaim that position again. So uh, flee from him as he sits both before the Lord's day and, 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 the, and attempts to, and the, he won't get it done, but attempts to in the close of the Lord's day, which is to say the close of the millennium. Now, God spreads us abroad, but any time the four winds are mentioned, I mean, we're talking last hour. It's the four winds that literally bring the end of this dispensation of time. It's the four winds that will come when that seventh trump sounds and everybody's going to be changed. It is the four winds and you'll find them written in both Daniel chapter 7 and you will find them written in Revelation chapter 7. And they are, if you can picture this, four winds from four directions that, that uh, center on one, that close in on one point. And that one point is the birth of a new age. So what God is telling you, I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. And he always uses those four winds. You will find them again concerning the end which pops into my mind, Ezekiel chapter 37, when the four winds blew upon the bones, and it was uh, referring to the end at that time. Verse 7 to continue. Uh, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. In other words, you that dwell in that confusion. That's what Babel is. 
BBL, Bob Ball, you that dwell in that confusion, deliver thyself. Did it say get some preacher to deliver you? No, it did not. It didn't tell you to go anywhere and get someone to help you to deliver thyself. It says, deliver thyself. He has, and listen, this is the angel of the Lord that's speaking. My advice is you better pay attention. He has written you this letter, this letter telling you exactly how it's going down when that Lord's day approaches and what it is that you're to do. Deliver thyself by doing what? Coming out of confusion. Don't, don't have any part with confusion. If you are a true Christian, you're a realist. And you do not let documentation be explained away as fiction. And um, you do not let somebody tell you that, that that is bad is good. You know what is bad and you know what is good. And you're able to determine for yourself. You don't need help. And when you have the seal of God in your forehead, as you're supposed to in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, that means you have God's truth in your mind because you, you have studied and absorbed the letter He has written to you, which is this Word of God. And you know how to deliver yourself. I, I cannot make this, well, my preacher said all I had to do is sit there in church and pay my tithe. And, and he was going to save me. Well, that's not biblical. No man can save you. Only Christ can. Christ is the one that paid the price. Uh, and I'm not talking against your pastors or anything of that nature. I'm just saying you've got to save thyself from confusion. Because it is your mind that can become confused with the very things reported, especially in this generation of the fig tree. You've got a lot of people running around trying to make right, wrong, and wrong, right. And that's written also that they would do exactly that. You have a bunch of people trying to remove the Word of God from our very vocabulary because they want their morality be to become the accepted thing where there is no morality and that would destroy our people. And if you say something to one of them, they will say, oh, I, I'm offended. Well, tough stuff, you know, get offended, get lost, get a life. You know, majority rules. That's the way this nation was founded, and that's the way she's going to be right up to the very end. This political correctness of somebody being offended, if you're that easily offended, go dig you a hole somewhere and crawl in it. Okay? Grow up. Get a life. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And when you mess around with wrong, you're going to end up in the wrong place. That's for save thyself from confusion. Well, how do I do that? By God's Word. That's what He's telling you. This happens to be the angel of the Lord that's speaking here. And uh, certainly, you live in a time, my friend, when Babylon, old sister Babylon, that is to say confusion, really reaches out from every corner. Everything is by precedent and by debating what this good man says and that good man says. Let me tell you something. Throw all of that in the drink. And listen to what God says. By that I mean when it comes to saving yourself, let God do it. Man will always let you down. Uh, so deliver thyself. And never let some man tell you that if you just listen to him, and you don't have to understand God's word, you're going to be gone. That's, you're falling right into the very trap of Satan when you listen to garbage like that. And, and um, that might even offend someone, but that's the truth. And the truth usually does offend those that are wrong. Verse 8, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, it's him speaking, After the glory 
hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Do you, do you know what the apple of God's eye is? That's the pupil. Let me ask you something. Has anyone ever stuck their finger in your pupil? It, it gets noticed pretty quick, doesn't it? In other words, what God is telling you, deliver yourself. If anybody bothers you, it's like touching the apple of my eye, like them sticking their finger in my eye. I'm not going to put up with it. That's what God is saying. So again, what does man have to worry about other than fear of the unknown itself? And if you suffer from the unknown, you are not studied, my friend. You need to absorb the Word of God. You know, that is quite a statement from our Father. It's just like those that might say, well, I, I be offended. Well, when, if you're offended by what is right and you're trying to talk us into listening to immorality making it right, you're touching God in the eye and he's going to slap you right up across the head. In other words, that hurts and it hurts him when people try to take the obvious and make it babble or confusion when he has spoken with such clarity of how he is the fire of the wall that protects us, that his Holy Spirit is with us. And as long as we utilize common sense, you don't want to mess with God's anointed. Again, it's like sticking your finger in God's eye and he will smash you. Get ready for it. It always happens. Verse 9, For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them. I'll shake my hand right on their head. And they shall be a soil, a spoil to their servants, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. In other words, I'm going to make them slaves to a slave. Now, that's, that's kind of uh, like the old saying, um, that's, uh, he's going to remove you to the very bottom rung of the ladder, my friend. Don't mess with God's anointed. Save thyself. That naturally, uh, you, if you were saving yourself, you would not be wishing to mess with one of God's anointed, or, or you're in bad trouble, friend. Well, will the anointed one warn me? Not likely. Uh-uh. Guess who's going to warn you or let you know? God is when he slaps you right up uh, like shakes. When God shakes his hand, it's pretty severe. He, he has no lost motion. Well, I didn't know God reacted that way. Well, do you think he was wasting time when he says, touch not mine anointed? Do you think he was wasting time in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, when he said, touch not, say, even to Satan, don't you dare touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. Well, the reason being, he can't. Because if you know the truth, as you've heard me say many times, we find him an abomination. And we know we have power over him. And we make, we make a quick trip for him before we send him crawling back where he came from. You know, you have nothing to fear. You have a wall, and you can deliver yourself. You are a child of God. And when someone touches you, it's like sticking their finger in God, poking their finger in God's pupil, the pupil of his eye. And naturally, he won't tolerate it. He won't put up with it. There's a reflex just like that. So let that strengthen you. By being in the right, well, how do I know I'm actually in the right? By studying your Father's Word, by listening to Him. It is a real world out there. Be a realist. Face it straight up, I mean, right on. Take care of the hardest first. Get it done. Always know what you're doing. And, well, how do I know what I'm doing? By studying God's Word and utilizing common sense. That that you have learned in this world, making you streetwise, keep it that way. That keeps you out of harm's way. Verse 10, 
sing and rejoice. That's what you should do. We've got everything in the world to rejoice and to sing about. O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. That's the Shekinah glory. God dwells there. He's coming. The Lord first is on the Lord's day. And the full Godhead de facto, de jure, I should say, at the end, of the, on that last day of the millennium, as um, every enemy is placed and destroyed in the wall of fire that becomes a lake of fire, God is a consuming fire. Matthew chapter 10, fear not he who can cause your flesh body to perish. But fear rather he that can cause your soul to die, perish, be done with, fini, never to be again. It's known as the last verse of Revelation chapter 20 and the verse before, the second death. The first death, death of the body, flesh body. Second death, death of the soul. You've got everything in the world to rejoice about. God is coming to dwell with us, and there will be nothing evil at that time. There will be nothing at it that offends. I'm talking about the eternity now. I'm talking about the third earth age. We will have that millennium period, the Lord's day, to go through before we make that uh, pilgrimage into perfection. I'm talking about a prefer perfect world where there is nothing that offends. You don't, you don't have to, you can rejoice, you can sing, there is nothing that will harm you at that time. And that's what we're all working forward to, is coming to that time. That's what makes it so important that you listen to your father, as he stated in verse seven, deliver thyself. Deliver yourself by listening to your father's word by knowing that every word of his word is true when you take it back to the original especially and you know and understand that you've got something to really sing about. Do you know why? Do, do you not? Do you get it? You are a child of the living God. You are related to, you are the offspring of the living God that has everything, owns everything, controls everything. And he's telling you, as my child, deliver yourself and then rejoice, knowing I'm going to take care of you. You got nothing to sweat. Verse 11. Now that's, that's ironic that I would say nothing to sweat when actually that's one of the reasons is that the clothing that allows you to come near our Father in, e in Ezekiel chapter 44 during the millennium, that is to say the Savior, uh, you can't sweat in it. It's, it is a material that would keep that from happening as it is written in Ezekiel 44. Ver uh, verse 11. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Now, what day is that? Well, that's the Lord's day. And shall be my people, that's to say, I me. Mean. And I will dwell in the midst of them. That's, that's um, Shema, Yahweh Shema. Last word in the great book of Ezekiel. God dwells there. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. The angel of the Lord speaking, sing, rejoice, be happy. Do you know why many nations are going to do that? Because if they don't, they won't, they won't exist. You know, after that millennium is over, there won't be a nation existing that would disagree with our Father or that would rebel against Him or that would give Him any problems. They just won't exist. That's why you want to deliver yourself from the confusion of this world. It is so simple and I'm repeating myself, but I feel led to do it. It is so simple to come out of confusion and face reality. By reality, you look at the world for what it is. If 
Well, well, give me an example of what, what, what do you mean, face reality? Well, if someone tells you they're looking for peace, peace, and they're blowing each other up, what does that say to you? What, what, what is the reality of it? They're at war. Absolutely at war. And you need to be able to recognize that and know something's wrong. You know, we have this situation today. We're in Iraq, old Babylon, that we have an old type, if you would, the king of Babylon, which is to say Hussein, Saddam Hussein, and he just keeps hanging on and hanging on. And do you know why mostly he's hanging on? You know, there was a, a letter released from him today, straight from the pit of the devil. I didn't bomb that clergy, the clergy there. I would never do that. Well, and he wouldn't gasp for 5,000 Kurds, would he? And naturally, he did it. But do you know what eggs him on and gives him hope? Is people in this nation that knock our troops that are there by saying they shouldn't be there. They should be brought home. They had no business going there in the first place. All this is aiding and abetting the enemy. This causes them to order, keep picking our boys off. In other words, they're the reason our boys are being picked off. They aid and abet the enemy by knocking our commander-in-chief and the generals in charge from there down. You know, I wonder, let's, let's take this one step further. Being a realist, what does it mean when someone aids and abets the enemy? That's treason. That's the real truth of it. And we live in a time you need to come out of of confusion and face reality, don't let people deceive you. Deliver yourself. Don't be a part. Come out of her, my people. That's God's instructions. And certainly, uh, we see this time that God is coming, and he's going to hold his servants accountable for what you have taught, what, what, who you have followed, whether it, you're supposed to follow him. Got it? So don't be deceived. Deliver thyself from the confusion and the lies and the misguidance of very selfish people that put politics before protecting this great nation when we have terrorists that want to blow our own children up, when we have people preventing that on foreign soil at this time, and shun and beware those that obey, a, a, that help our enemy. Because they're nothing but treasonous. They are tre uh, uh, have committed treason. It's a very serious thing. Well, it sounds serious. It is serious. It's not, it's not nice to see our boys and girls come home in coffins because some loose lips here say, we just ought to pick them up and bring them out of there. We shouldn't have been there in the first place. All that does is encourage our enemy there to keep his snake hive going. Stop it. Okay, let's go back to the next verse. Some might think I digressed. I didn't. I was right on the money. Verse 12. And the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the holy land and shall choose Jerusalem again. He, he's not, uh, Satan intends to take it over, all right? And that's where the false Messiah will set his throne. God is going to reclaim it. It will be, you know, it's his favorite place in the world. Ezekiel chapter 16, he made an eternal, everlasting covenant with the land of Judea, my favorite place in the universe. And he is coming back there, and that is our hope. That is our precious hope. That's what we live for, is to look forward to that day. But, beloved, we must save as many people as we can from being uh, caught up and, and uh, encircled and netted by confusion.
Babylon, which is to say Satan, who is the king of Babylon of the great book of Revelation, which this is a cousin to Satan. That's who the king of Babylon is. Verse 13, to complete this chapter 2, Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy mountain. In other words, he has remembered the name of the book, Zechariah, remembered of Yah. He has remembered and he has raised up. He's going to insist on action. The reason God's inner position, his purpose of bringing in everlasting peace and destroying that that is wicked, destroying that that is against our Father. And do you know something? What does this mean, O oh, all flesh? Well, number one, what happens at the seventh trump? All convert from flesh to spiritual bodies. And what it's saying here, the flesh would be the heathen, basically. Just keep quiet. If you don't know what you're talking about, keep quiet and before the Lord. Then why don't you learn, God, even if you were heathenistic, by that I mean a non-Christian that understands nothing about God's Word. Why wouldn't you put that aside and become a child of God and deliver thyself? Save yourself. There's not one living soul in the flesh that isn't a child of God. That is to say that soul that lie, dwells therein. They are a child of God. And God made salvation possible to whomsoever will. In other words, deliver thyself. God is there to help you. God is there to lead you. Listen, we're approaching this time in history when that Lord's Day is very close because you happen to live in the generation of the fig tree. Jesus said concerning that parable of the fig tree, not maybe that you should get around to learning it. He said, learn it. Because it lets you know the time sequence of these events as, they, as the birth of a new age transpires before your very eyes. Look at what's happening in Babylon today, my friend. Do you know where Babylon is, the old city of Babylon? It's about, 50, let's just say, 60 miles south of Baghdad. Do you know what's going on in Baghdad right now? Well, you should. We're seeing sign after sign after sign of the events of this time. Wake up. Stop the measuring, of course. Observe what's happening. Deliver thyself. Do it by turning to him and letting his strength enable you to be a great blessing to his children that need your help. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?